Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to Aspire, JFN's annual high holiday gathering. More than ever before, our community needs to come together for reflection, inspiration, and connection. And what community means has shifted for many of us over, over the last year or two. And I'm thrilled that over 100 people have registered to join us today and have chosen to take the time to hear wisdom from religious and communal thought leaders on what community is and can be. And I'm now happy to turn it over to Andres Spaconi, President and CEO of JFN, and Rabbi Rebecca Serbu, Executive Vice President of JFN, to start us off today with some Torah reflections and conversations. Thank you, Andres and Rebecca. Thank you, Tamar. And it's a big pleasure to be uh, partnering with Moment Magazine and with our friends to talk about this critical issue, which is the, the future of the idea of community in, in, in the Jewish people, but everywhere. Because one of the issues that gave, that gave us the idea for this, for this event, for this, for, this, um, for this symposium, is the realization that we all feel in our bones, in our kishkes, that the idea of community is in crisis. The idea of community as we know it is in crisis. And the traditional forms of community are being challenged by the realities in which we live. They feel not adequate to the human beings of the 21st century. And that creates a big malaise that we feel in the Jewish community, but also other communities experience too. So on the eve of our most gregarious of holidays, which is Sukkot, um, and in the midst of the high holidays, we thought it was interesting and important to talk about the future of community, the idea of community, and what we can do to get it right. We've been getting it right for 4,000 years. Uh, we, can, we can still do it. So I, I'm gonna just, you know, we're gonna play some ping pong with uh, Rebecca about our observations about community in this, in this day and age. Uh, Rabbi Rebecca Servi has been working in alternative communities and in traditional communities. And she has a, I would say very, um, hands-on experience on the changes that I see more from the philosophical perspective. So I'll, I'll start by saying this. Um, the idea of community is being challenged by the rise of what I call the hyper-empowered individual. In modern times, from 300 years on, the individual has been emancipating herself from structures of power. In the modern times, in the early modern times, the human being emancipated himself from the church, then emancipated itself from the political parties, from the state, uh, gaining more and more individual freedoms and more and more individual rights. And we, and we reach this day and age in which the individual is hyper empowered, meaning it has more autonomy, more power, and more capacity to interact with the world on her own without the intermediate of any communal setting than, be, than ever before in Jewish history. We have all the power we need here in these little machines uh, to interact with the world. We don't need a community to interact with the world. And the value that we hold dearest in this day and age is the value of self-realization and self-fulfillment. Right? And, and that goes against the idea of collective fulfillment and collective realization. In other words, until the 21st century, the individuals were supposed to uh, give, give away their individuality to be part of their community. Today, they don't want that bargain anymore. They don't want to give away any of their individuality to be part of a collective. Collective structures like communities, like belongings, like belongings to synagogues, to JCCs, are seen as limitations to the freedom of, the, of that individual. And nothing that limits the freedom of the individual works in a time of hyper empowered individuals. So that leaves us with a conundrum. Uh, we are gregarious you know, human beings. Human beings, are as, as a species, are a gregarious species. But the forms of community we have that put the collective 
above the individual don't work because precisely they go against the grain of one of the main characteristics of the time. So, Rebecca, what do you uh, what do you see? What, what did you see in your experience from the communities in which you've been about this dichotomy, about this this tension? Yeah, so thanks, Andres. I think you're absolutely right. There is a big tension right now between the individual and the community. And I've experienced it, in fact, in my last two positions in the Jewish world. So I spent 10 years working with a network of rabbis called Rabbis Without Borders. So right away, you hear the name Without Borders, and you realize that we are playing with this exact economy between the individual and the community. As typically with the, rabbis, the idea, right. The idea that you want to be limited by the borders, right? So Correct. you call it without borders. Yeah. Exactly. We don't want to be limited by the borders of community, by the borders of ideas, by the borders of geography, right? Or even, uh, you know, the limits of a computer screen in some ways. Um, so we were very much playing with this new paradigm of how do rabbis reach out to individuals who do want to be part of community because studies show that individuals do in some sense want to be part of a community. They just want to be part of community in different ways. And so I spent 10 years working with rabbis who were really um, playing right around the edges of this idea, who were creating new, uh, what they were calling intentional communities or spiritual communities rather than synagogues because synagogue felt too, um, uh, contracted or too bordered right to people and we would play here and see what are ways that we could attract people to come together in gatherings without demanding from them dues or allegiance to a particular ideology or allegiance to a, a particular group for a, an extended period of time. Um, at the same time, in my last position, I was at a great national organization named Hadassah, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Amazing legacy organization that is based on membership, right? And that there are members, there's a, in fact, the, the greatest thing Hadassah has is a lifetime membership. I can't tell you how many people when I introduced myself as being the, uh, you know, the um, director of engagement and members are like, oh, I might probably want a lifetime membership to Hadassah, right? And so there was something about this membership in this legacy organization uh, that had some power, but Hadassah, like most other legacy organizations, were st uh, is still in this, in this membership mode and is really struggling with exactly what I was playing with the rabbis about. How do we attract individuals into this larger, big, community when the idea of paying for a membership, in fact, a lifetime membership just to, to today's, um, in today's day and age just doesn't make a lot of, a lot of sense. So Andres, I've absolutely seen this play out in today's community, both in startup organizations and in legacy organizations, and it is an ongoing challenge. Yeah. But, you know, let me ask you though, um, there are people who seem to really, uh, be drawn to communities like uh, the rise of QAnon and, um, and other ideologically centered types of communities that seem to in fact be gaining strength in spite of what you just put forth yeah. as uh, uh, you know, push and pull of this. What do, what do you make of that? I think, I think it's, a, it's a great observation because I think that, as I said, people have the need to belong. And they find themselves in a perplexity because they find the need, they have that need to belong, but they realize that the traditional avenues to belonging, like what you say, lifetime membership, doesn't speak to them, right? They feel it feels as too limiting, as too, you know, contrived. So, so they, but but then when you don't fulfill that need to belonging, it's going to explode some way. So people are going to belong irrationally. To a to a cult like thing like QAnon, but it's a but it's a, a dysfunctional response, I think, to the malaise of community, because some of these groups and they are equally radical on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, they offer you a sense of a, a diffuse sense of belonging, but they're not a true community. Nobody from QAnon is going to come and make you a tea if you're sick. Right, nobody's going to come and, and and help you if you need if you need help. You're not going to have any of the of the trappings of community in a good way of the of the benefits of community. You you only going to have some temporary succor to the idea 
that you don't belong to anything, that your belonging is broken, so at least you belong to something that makes you feel good. But it's, but it's a dysfunctional thing. It's, it's like a fix in a way that doesn't address the issue that, 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 that we have, which is the need actually to reinvent a community for a time of hyper-empowered individuals. And one of the things that I'm gonna say that it's really interesting is that even the most traditional communities now speak in terms of postmodern values of self-expression of self-realization. You know, for example, when, when the gay prep parade wanted to be in Jerusalem, the Haredi population that opposed it didn't oppose it because they said, you know, God forbids it. They oppose it because they say our individual rights as ultra-Orthodox people are being violated by that. In other words, they are they even the most traditional communities are using this language of individualism to justify. And by the way, the same with QAnon, the same, God forbid, I'm not comparing ultra Oxy with QAnon. I'm just saying that people that you can't qualify as postmodern are actually using postmodern arguments to defend their belongings in those groups and to defend their, their things. But there are experiments, there are experiments, sorry, that seem to be working, that seem to be sort of mixing together the power of the individual self-realization with the power of community. What, what have you seen there? Or rather, more than working, what are, what are the experiments that are being done, both in the Jewish world and the non-Jewish world? What are people tinkering with uh, that, it's, that is showing some promise? Uh, that's a great question. So I'm going to start actually from the secular world, because that's part of what we did in Rabbis Without Borders, is we looked at what, what things were working in the secular world that we might be able to bring into the Jewish world. So the first thing, and this may surprise some of you, we looked at what was happening with gym membership, right? If you think of membership organizations, gyms are really the, the largest driver of membership in the secular world. And we know in uh, looking at demographic studies within the Jewish world that membership organizations have been suffering, right? KCC membership are down, synagogue membership are down. So we wanted to know what was happening in the secular world. Well, guess what? Gym memberships are also trending down. People are not joining gyms the way that they used to for exactly the same reason. They don't want to give up any of their individual autonomy. So the latest trends that you can find about gyms right now are they are not offering memberships. Instead, they're posting online individual classes and people go online and they pick and choose the individual classes that mean something to them and so that they can create their own um, fitness you know, fitness schedule and uh, workouts the way they want. Then taking that one step further, gyms have also learned that they can be more successful if they themselves create the community. So how are they doing that, right? And that was really what we were interested in by letting individuals uh, work towards their own fitness goals, but still drawing them back to a particular gym so that they're not jumping around to different places. So there are two examples that really stand out. One is Soul Cycle, and the other is a gym called CrossFit. Both of these gyms allow for great autonomy in individuals to set their own fitness goals, their own ability to push themselves and work harder, and at the same time connect them in what we would call a traditional community uh, with the other people who are working out at the same time as them. So for instance, CrossFit became known because you work out in a pod of like 20 people. And of those 20 people, they could you could have different fitness goals and working at different rates. But those 20 people would check in with each other, much like a traditional minion. If someone didn't show up some one day, one of the people would crawl them and say, hey, John, I saw you weren't at, at uh, gym today. What's going on? Right? Or uh, if it turns out John was sick, Jim would say, let me bring you a bowl of soup. Let me, let me help you get better because I want to see you back in the gym. That's as we imagine and we know traditional synagogue communities worked. So some of the rabbis I was working with borrowed from this model and said, okay, if signing up for membership doesn't work, how do we still get financial contributions from people and create the same type of community? So a lot of synagogues have been trying this um, the heart model. Instead of people paying upfront 
$2,000 for their yearly membership. Instead, a synagogue will, in fact, be very transparent with its budget, which not all of them had been ahead of time, and lay out why $2,000 was set as the optimal right, uh, dues membership, and then say, but we're not asking you for dues. We're not asking you for membership. We're asking if you would like to continue to be a part of our community and you find meaning, which is also very important in this, if you find meaning in being a part of our community, please pay what you feel is the right amount. Please pay a gift right, of your heart. Um, and as an organization, around $2,000 is what we'd like to suggest because most of us who did this did make a suggested rate, but really nobody was held to it. And you could pay more, you could pay less, and it's actually proven to be quite successful uh, in the synagogues that have tried this, there was not a huge drop off as they expected of everyone deciding to pay, you know, $10 for the year. In fact, most of the synagogues have been able to continue bringing in the same amount of money from what they used to call dues as when they make this in a um, up to the individual, you see, to decide what it is they want to contribute to the community at large and set their own boundaries and expectations. So that, that's one of the main things that I've seen played with both in the secular and in the Jewish sphere. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that playing with this idea of this balance between fluidity and permanence, right? Yes. Like mm -hmm. one of the things that, that scare, quote unquote, scare people is the idea that I'm signing up for life and I lose my freedom. But what you're exactly. saying is you're saying, well, there are ways that you can actually take the best of both, of both worlds, have a continuity, but also giving fluidity to belong to different groups. And it reminds me a little bit of the old idea of the Chavura, which uh, yeah. had some elements of, of of what you're talking about, but there is, you know, just just to finish because we we I mean we could be talking about this forever and we will, but uh, we have to continue with the program. Just one one last thing that I wanted to very briefly explore is the impact that the virtual community, the online experience, has, and we all lived through online very intensively during the uh, uh, during this year and a half. Um, but there was a cyber utopianism that said that internet would be the solution for our communal woes. Like we would, we would learn to do community on the internet and, and, and online communities will be the future and will be great and meaningful and whatever. And we didn't see that happen or did we? Well, I think that's an interesting uh, question. In some cases, I think there are some very successful online communities. I know I myself am part of a few Facebook groups that uh, I feel very close to the people in, in those groups, and they very much are a community. For example, one is the Year of the Jewish Woman Facebook group, where the key, though, I think, to successful online communities is creating a core of meaning and value that people get from that community. The Year of the Jewish Woman Facebook group is successful because there is a key value for promoting uh, Jewish women, uh, mainly professionally, and that's why people are in that group and why people post and keep coming back to it. And people are interested in what others have to say, even though there are uh, perspectives across the, you know, across the um, the political sphere. And then one other example I found is I think it's. It's the hybrid nature sometimes that also makes a huge difference. So for instance, when I was working at Rabbis Without Borders, like at JFN, we had a once a year conference, but the relationships did not begin and end at that once a year conference. There was an ongoing Google group where 250 rabbis, only about half of whom had ever been to the in-person conference, had ongoing conversations and built ongoing community. So that, you know, there was a touch point in real life and then there was ongoing community built online. So I think there are ways to do it online, but it is certainly not panacea the way some people expected it to be. Great. So as you see, as we, we're just starting to scratch the surface and, and we have, as a community, we have our work cut out for us, meaning we, we need to do something that our four parents did in the, in the, in the, through, through millennia, which is to, articulate new forms of community. The value of community for the Jewish people is timeless. We, we believe in community, but the articulation of that value, how community looks, is deeply influenced by the historical realities. The, the Kehillah or the, or the, of, of, of uh, East Europe or the 
Alhama of uh, Sephardic Spain are not the same as the Jewish Federation. They are historical manifestation of the timeless value of community. And I think that our task now is to find what, what is the most adequate, or, or the most adequate in plural, uh, uh, forms of community for the 21st century. And to talk a little bit more about that, I thank you very much, Rebecca, and I giving the floor to our partner from Moment Magazine, Nadine Epstein. Hi, thank you so much. That was wonderful, Andres, and wonderful, Rebecca, Ra Rabbi Rebecca. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine, and I'm also executive director of the Washington, D.C.-based Center for Creative Change, where we run a lot of very creative and innovative projects. And um, we here at Moment have been thinking a lot about community, um, particularly once COVID hit and accelerated the process of change so much. Um, like so many other Americans, we've been spent hours lamenting the failure of community and pining for the past and we're stumped by the present and we worry about the future. And so earlier this year, we partnered with JFN and we decided to explore, well, what is community? What does it mean today? Because it's such an important question at the core of all of our conversations. And as we usually do when we take on one of our big question projects here, uh, we basically interview as many people as we can think of, really creative, interesting people from different perspectives. This is not a yes or no question. Um, it's a question that transcends religion and culture. So we don't only even talk to Jews. Everybody is part of community. So um, I think actually, are we gonna see some quotes about community now? Um, these quotes are from our community symposium that we just did. Well, there are so many interesting people and, 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 and ideas in this. And for this conversation, I wanted to include a couple of very creative women thinkers who have had interesting paths and have accumulated a lot of wisdom. And I wanted to have a bit of a free flowing conversation with them. The first, and can you guys come on please, is the wonderful Anita Diamond, who is a writer, a thinker, an activist, one of my inspirations and also the very creative Shailen Romney Garrett, who wrote the book with Robert Putnam, the new book, Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Um, so there are so many different, let me just start with you, Shailen. Um, the book that you wrote, what, tell us about Upswing um, and why did it swing down? Tell us. Sure, so, so the Upswing takes as a starting point um, Robert Putnam's famous work, Bowling Alone, which you know, Rabbi Rebecca referenced the fact that membership organizations are in decline today, but that's a phenomenon that has been going on for about 70 years. And that's research that uh, Professor Putnam uh, detailed in the book Bowling Alone, which came out 20 years ago, in which he sort of decried this vast decline in American associationalism and in something called social capital, which is really the word that we use to describe the value that relationships and community have in, in society. Um, and so this is a trend that's been going on for over half a century in America that we have been losing by very measurable hard measures we've been losing our connection with our community um, in this country. And in the upswing, what we did was actually zoom out to look at um, not just that half century or more of decline, mm -hmm. but also the half century that came before it and asking, well, what was going on before we lost all of this community? And also asking the question, were there other trends um, that were similar in nature? To, to this loss of, of social connection. And so in the upswing, we look at 125 years of American history and we look at four different lenses on American society. We look at economics. Was America moving in a direction of more economic equality or less economic equality and how fast and when? Was America, uh, we also look at the second lens, which is um, uh, political cooperation or political polarization. At what point were we becoming more polarized or less polarized? We also look at um, that question of society, connectedness, social capital. Um, were Americans coming together more or, or falling apart, our social fabric, right? And the fourth lens that we look at is culture. Were we moving in a direction of a more solidaristic, we're all in this together mindset and cultural values or more in the direction of hyper-individualism? And what we actually see is that all four of those trends are remarkably coordinated and correlated over 125 years in American history. So today we are in an incredibly eye-focused, extremely unequal, extremely polarized, extremely narcissistic, and extremely um, lonely and atomized state by, by very hard measures. But it turns out we were in that exact same state as a society on all of those different measures um, at the beginning of the 20th century in a period known as the Gilded Age. But between those two poles of hyper-individualism, we experienced an upswing a dramatic shift toward um, more equality, toward more cooperation, toward more um, collaboration, and toward, um, toward a greater sense of working together over the course of 70 years. And then in the mid-1960s, all of those measures took an abrupt turn downward, landing us uh, where we are today. And so the upswing asks the question, it, first of all, it sort of elucidates that remarkable set of data that show us where we've been on these measures over 125 years, and then ask the question, well, if we got out of this mess once before, back in the Gilded Age, uh, how could we do it again? Could we create another upswing today and move America back in the direction toward we? Mm -hmm. Ha, Anita, well, I think you have a very different perspective on um, communities that you wrote about in our symposium, in our big question project about how communities have these natural cycles. And so tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I'm honored to be here. And uh, I still don't quite know why I'm in part of this conversation. You're here um, because you're very I, creative. I, I know, because I'm a creative person. I know, I know. Um, there's so many aspects to this. Um, and I have even in the few decades that I have been hanging around the Jewish community, which means speaking in congregations and Jewish community centers and women's organizations because of a book I wrote. Um, I've seen all kinds of changes. And one of the things that occurred to me is that there's a bigger tent in the Jewish community than there used to be. And so there's a redefinition of the community in, in especially in terms of the organized community. I remember going to, I was in Washington, I think, and I asked many years ago, how many people in the room have a relative uh, who has converted to Judaism? And I don't know, 10. If I ask that question today, almost everybody, and if I say, not just, not just your blood relatives, but your in-laws and their children, yeah. you can put up your hands, 
And the community has now embraced this notion that Jews by choice are Jews. And now also Jews by affiliation, people who haven't formally converted to Judaism, but who are raising Jewish children who are paying dues, um, who are studying and who, uh, who affiliate uh, are part of the Jewish community too. And it's part like the redefinition of what a family looks like, right? It used to be heterosexual with children, you know, part of this extended family ideally, but now, you know, families are intentional and they are also welcomed into the larger organized Jewish community. So, you know, I've seen all that kind of change. Um, and I think we have to really rethink about, rethink community. I, I think there are two areas where community is in fact bubbling up. And one of them is uh, the arts, Jewish arts. And the other is uh, social justice work where there's enormous passion among young Jews um, who affiliate a lot online, a lot virtually, a lot hybrid, um, for whom it is the center of their existence. And it's not, it, it, you can't be political all by yourself. You don't get anywhere. So they're organized. So those are just, you know, random thoughts about how the Jewish community has changed, is changing. Um, and I remember what I learned as a student, as an adult learner about Judaism, is that organizations come and go, they die, and that isn't the end of the Jewish community. Synagogues die, it's not the end of the Jewish community. And, and just thinking about my community here in the greater Boston area, there's lots of congregations that have uh, that are dwindling, that are merging. And then there's some congregations that are booming. And part of it has to do with demographics, where Jews are living and where they're not living anymore, where they can't afford to live anymore, where they want to live now. Um, and that's everything from a shtibel, sort of liberal shtibel in, in a rabbi's big, big dining room to a really, to actually to Temple Israel, which is sort of the big flagship reform uh, establishment forever um, congregation, which is a very lively place and attracts a lot of young people in a partially in a community that doesn't require dues, which is the Riverway project, um, which is a doorway. So, you know, so fluidity change is part of all of this. And I think we're in the middle of, um, of, of inflow as well as, as outflow. It has to do with leadership and vision also, which is something that we're going to get to in a couple of minutes, because that's really, really important. And I agree with you. I think we, the Jewish community is actually like stronger. The communities are stronger than ever. We're kind of constantly, we've been around for 4,000 years. We've been reinventing ourselves. Um, I feel like Jewish wisdom and community has even gone beyond the Jewish community and become part of the larger community of the United States in such a, in a major way. So I think it's like a very exciting time that we live in because but things are evolving tremendously um and also i feel like we can belong to many different communities at one time like you know last rosh hashanah i went to my son's by by virtual virtually i went to my son's yom kippur service and i went to a different one and um you know i could i could explore a lot of different synagogues but also i can explore as a human being so many different communities um jewish communities and that's very exciting um so does size matter? And I want to go through some of these questions pretty quickly because we want to get to the new ideas soon. Um, but does size matter for a community? Um, what do you think, Shailen? Um, I do. I do think that size matters. I think that um, there is good social science around this, actually. We know something mm -hmm. called Dunbar's number, which is, which is uh, Robin Dunbar did research and showed that 150 is about um, the size of a community in which we can experience a depth of relationship with every member of that community and feel a sense of belonging that doesn't feel overwhelming. Um, and so we do know that there is sort of an ideal size of a community. Um, and, 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 and when we think about that in modern terms, we think about sort of maybe a neighborhood about this, you know, that being about the size of, of what we can handle. Um, and I do think there is a certain trade-off. You you can get a lot of benefit from breadth um, by widening the tent, but there are also maybe some things that are lost. And I think that particularly when we're looking at online connections as a way of rebuilding social capital, that is something that we need to think about. And in the work that I've done consulting with Facebook about training their group leaders, you know, to be good leaders of these online communities that have been a really important replacement for in-person yeah. communities that have been lost. Um, 
there's a weird, there's a strange trade-off because Facebook is driving these leaders to get to scale, right? Get 2 million members in your Facebook group to be considered successful. But there's important conversations to be had about what is lost when you're pushing leaders to get to 2 million. Um, what then, yeah, and then there are some creative ways to get around that where you're doing chapters or you're small grouping or doing other things. Um, and actually religious congregations, um, have pioneered a lot of that small grouping that give people a way to check in and be in in face face to face community, even in the context of a larger broad tent. And so there are a lot of creative strains here. Um, we do know again the social science is clear about what the ideal is, but that's not you know we don't we're not always operating under ideal conditions when we're in the real world. And so so there that's where the creativity comes in. So Anita, you started really we were the instigation your book and then your work your work with my time was part of the it started this whole global mikvah movement now this is a movement that's got you know i actually it's a fascinating movement and it's lasted it's been i don't know it has thousands hundreds of thousands of women and men perhaps who are also part of it so what do you think about size and community um, I don't know about 100,000, and uh, certainly there are men and women. Um, so Mayim Chaim was a reinvention of mikvah, which is a very one of the most ancient Jewish practices. Um, it is the least verbal of our practices. It's the most um, physical. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to know. You don't have to know Hebrew to have a, a very profound Jewish religious ritual experience in the mikvah. And, um, you know, so we talk about reinventing it. I also talk about hijacking the mikvah um, and taking it to a really different place. And at my Chaim in Boston, you know, we're celebrating like almost 17 years um, since we opened. And um, it, it is a community in a sense that people who volunteer there and people who become ambassadors for the place feel a very profound connection and then reach out to the rest of the community. People who use the mikvah, um, uh, some of them come on a monthly basis and they don't necessarily um, see the mikvah as a place to gather with other people, but they feel part of this connection. Um, because, actually, and so Mayim Haim has worked to create a national and really indeed international network of uh, mikvah out because there is the demand is out there. There is, there is a need for it, which I think we identified that you don't have to be an Orthodox married Jewish woman to to, to need mikvah in your life. So we've, we have created a sort of global movement, which is kind of a community, which, com which communicates by and large online. Um, the pandemic pushed the creation of even more national, international education for teaching organizations how to grow, how to train mikvah guides. They meet each other, they learn from each other. And so, so it is, it is um, it's in some ways an adjunct to a community, but it's also a doorway into Jewish life. And I think doorways are very important at this point. And, um, and this is a point of contact that is unique in a lot of ways. Um, I think the arts open doors to Jewish wisdom and Jewish soul and, uh, and, and boy, is it diverse um, in ways that very few things do. But when you get an audience together and by that's happening. Um, you see people, you encounter people in your own town who keep coming to the same, um, to the same, not to the same kinds of organization. In Boston, we have the Jewish Arts Collaborative, which is basically doesn't have a building, so it has been a virtual community for a long time, using um, different venues, different synagogues, using the, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston for a Hanukkah party for many years, where thousands of people came. So it's not. That's not a, the kind of community that brings you soup, but it is a doorway into understanding that you're part of a larger, uh, and that you're part of a porous community that you can be, you know, there've been um, concerts at Symphony Hall, at, at Jordan Hall, which are, you know, iconic Boston places, which have become Jewish spaces where lots of people came, Jews and non-Jews have come to share stuff. So that's, that's a different doorway. It's a different way of understanding. It's a different way of gathering. And the hybrid stuff works very well, both bringing people in, allowing them, if you can't, if you don't have mobility, allowing people who can or, or don't drive at, at night anymore to participate and talk to their friends about it. Um, so so there's, there's just new doorways in um, and in a big, into a bigger tent. 
That's true. I think of Moment as a big community also. We have so many people who connect through all of our different events and different programs because as I think Rabbi Rebecca said, meeting and content are at the core of communities often. And we have so many different kinds of content. And especially during COVID, um, people have really flocked to our programming a lot of our online, online programming, and it's become a real community of people who come back, who get meaning. It's almost like creating online can be like creating a congregation. You can create a congregation online. It may not be a religious congregation per se, it might be, not be led by a rabbi, but there are so many conversations that are occurring online that are, that are just fascinating and so exciting, I think at this point. Um, one more thing I just want to say about, yeah. about permanence. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we're very attached to, to permanence, even though Jewish history is a long lesson in um, survival and thriving um, in the face of change. Some of it horrific, you know, by, by suffering and some by embracing uh, larger communities at the same time. And there's always been hair pulling about using secular music in a religious setting. I mean, that, that has been, that, that has been a, a fight that goes back centuries. And yet it in, and then in the, in the rear view mirror, it's like, that's why we're still here, right? Because we did, because we did incorporate stuff from the larger community and, and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't make us less than, in fact, it made us Because you've been than. creative and inventing. And yes, in fact, inventing. Judaism has been this process of creation and inventing. But I wanted to say something for, I'm the daughter of an, my mom was an executive director of a Jewish community center. So I grew up in a Jewish community center. Um, it took a long time before they made her the woman, the executive director. But anyways, eventually she became the executive director um, after a, a long series of men. And so I grew up there and that Jewish community center has been through a lot of changes. Um, it's a building, it's a building. She helped, she built the pool, she built the fitness center, but people still come to that. That is still very valuable. Um, there, you know, it, what has been hit by COVID, but you know, old organizations and old communities um, have also need support and are also important and meet the needs of, you know, some of those people are not online, but a lot of those people who go to the Jewish Community Center are also online and want that connection. So I just think that's really important. Um, I want to actually skip to a question. So I want to make sure we have time for this question, which is, um, let's talk about how these, how communities supported by the philanthropic community, um, how mission driven organizations are visionaries who have an idea for community, how they, how they interact with philanthropy and Shailen, you want to start us a little bit on that? Sure. Maybe I'll say something that's maybe a little bit tangential, but I think also related okay. to this question that came to my mind as I was listening to the, you know, this last exchange, I think, you know, um, I keep hearing phrases repeated about this community is meeting needs or, or, you know, this is where people are coming to get something or to, you know, um, and I think there's a real danger. And this is something I mentioned in my interview with, with, the, with the magazine was that I think there's a danger of treating people as consumers of community. I think in this hyper individualistic moment that Andres was pointing out that we are definitely in as a society, as American society, and I think that that is true more broadly of sub communities within America as well, um, including, um, including the Jewish faith, I would say um, part of that hyper individualistic culture that we're swimming in is a culture of treating people like consumers. So there's this idea that we that a community should be created by someone or something funded by someone or something in order to provide something to individuals. And I think that that's a little bit problematic. I think that that community at its best is about collaboration. It's about people doing something together, doing something for one another. And actually going back to, to the Facebook groups, the Facebook groups that are most vibrant um, are those that actually direct people to serve one another rather than directing people to be served by the group mm -hmm. or by the existence of the, you know, whatever entity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, a lot of times with philanthropy, 
there has been over the last several decades a sort of business template that has infiltrated philanthropic thinking. And that business template treats people like clients and consumers, right? And so, and so um, community organizations that maybe used to be a bit more organic uh, have shifted a bit into a service provision model. And that's often driven by the funders who want to see scale, they want to see measurable outcomes, and they want to see how many bowl bowls of soup have been given out rather than caring about who gave the soup to who, right? And I think that there is a real lifeblood of community that is lost in that model. And so my advice to funders would be to to open some space for creative thinking about what um, organizations should look like in order to be creating community. Because we know that there's been a huge you know, boom in, in sort of philanthropic funding, but that actually hasn't solved our loneliness epidemic as a society, that's only deepened. And so maybe we need to be thinking differently about what we're funding, particularly in terms of how it involves people in the work of the organization versus just as consumers of a service. That's a great point. Um, um, can I just say something I'm thinking, ahead, about, thinking about Mikva, which is the only organizational experience I have. When people come, and, and most people who come to my mind have many, more than more than half, have never been before, have never walked, never thought they would go to a Mikva. It's not for me. They walk in and and are, have a powerful personal experience. But part of that experience is understanding that this this is available to them because there's a community of people who are providing this for them. Um, and a lot of them connect to it one way or another. They may make a contribution, <clears throat> they will tell friends, <clears throat> they'll support their congregation if they belong to a congregation's support for Mayim Haim. So they see how community, um, it, it benefits them, but it's, it's, um, it's such, it's, we're talking about a, a sort of soul benefit. And it's it's hard to quantify, and I know that um, that at Mayim Haim has has been on the the merry-go-round of what's what's the new program that you're doing, what's the newest project, how many people, how how are we scaling, um, and that's part of what we do. But it's it really is very um, it's very personal. It's very one at a time, connecting people one at a time, and making them realize or giving them the opportunity to realize that they are in fact part of something larger than themselves that's, that supports not just their need, but somebody else's needs. And that includes even hearing stories about it. So hearing that a friend who was undergoing cancer treatment at the end of her treatment brought her friends with her to the mikveh, including nurses and best friends and parents, and not all of them were Jewish, to, to, to be part of this ritual of renewal of this, I am no longer a patient, now I'm somebody who's recovered from this disease. And that spreads and that word spreads and it, it advertises the fact that there is a place of meaning and there's a source of meaning that is uh, profound. And, you know, scaling it sounds very weird on some level, um, which is one of the reasons we always had rabbis on board, uh, on the board to remind people that we are not in the business of making money, and that you don't charge people for a mitzvah, um, you offer them the opportunity to make a gift, but that's a different thing. So, so you know, funding meaning meaning is a fun is a weird thing, <laughs> in a way, yes. right? As is and funding relationship, of, right? Right. The idea, relationship the idea is that a weird you, thing. Yeah. How do you fund that, right? And we have to stay away from the idea that you make money on creating community. Right. I think that that's a big confusion um, when you're doing mission driven work. It's not about making money. Um, it's about the people who are part of that community. And so I think that often gets conflated in conversations with philanthropists. You know, how, you know, what kind of income are you bringing in is really not the quite the right question to get. Um, so, um, and then we also, there's the, the other very frustrating part is that there are organizations, of course, that. Um, once provided a lot of community or were communities that have endowments that, of course, um, never, these organizations will never die because they have endowments, but they no longer really are the kind of communities that they once were. Um, so that's always very frustrating as well. Um, so let's switch to a few ideas for like communities today. Um, so one of the things, Anita, you spoke about you, when we interviewed you um, for the Big Question Project, you talked about a vision that you had for quite a while 
And um, I think it's one that resonates with a lot of people. And I thought maybe you'd tell us about it. You're talking about co-housing, I think. I am indeed. I did. Um, you know, last two weeks ago in the New York Times, the design section had a thing about um, co-housing in a way. Um, and it strikes me, especially in the United States, that it's it's um, a real matter of privilege and you have to have a lot of money to actually think about this. Um, but ideally, a fantasy for a good 30 years would have been to have bought a, a building somewhere in the Boston, in the city, um, a dilapidated bitty, bit city, uh, building and fill it with um, friends, like-minded friends. Um, not everybody needs a, a dishwasher, a, a washer dryer, maybe we could share that, you know, we, we would save money that way. As we've aged, we've talked about having in-house yoga classes. And, uh, you know, if you can't drive anymore, then there are people in the building of younger ages who will drive for you. So the idea of a multi-generational, not necessarily blood relative place to live with other people. Um, there was conversation for a while, and I, I really don't know if this is still happening, and I'll make it nameless, that there was a, a summer camp that had a lot of property, um, and there was talk about building housing on that land um, for, you know, for some of the grandparents as funders of uh, who would be you know, sort of part of this, but that it would be a multi-generational uh, Jewish community in, in part of a larger community. I don't know if it, this was just a conversation. I don't think it went anywhere because it's it's expensive and it's outside of the box. And, you know, do, do, is it just for Jews? Is that a good idea? Um, it, it's just, but it didn't go anywhere. I just think it's, that would be a nice thing for us to start thinking about intentional communities. Um, when I've gone to, uh, you know, I live in a big diff, diff, diffuse city, there are Jewish organizations all over the place, but having been in Jewish communities where there's a campus, right? Smaller cities where everything is in, one place where there's the Jewish Community Center, there's housing for the elderly, there's two or three synagogues, you know, all of that in one place um, feels doesn't feel like home anyway, um, except perhaps for the for the elders living there. But it's um, it's a place where you get services. Uh, to go back to what Shailen was saying, rather it's like a marketplace of of Jewish life. Um, not that I want the shtetl because I am an individual and no way do I want, do I want to go back to everybody knowing my business or or telling me what my choices should be. Um, you know, I'm very I'm very wedded to my choices. You know, I I'm not interested in giving them up. I am interested in sharing my life with other people um, in meaningful ways. Um, so you know, I don't want to I don't want us to just keep um, dumping on um, uh, the the individual as um as it's an okay it's okay i don't want there's to impose my choice on, on what pardon me there's okay. great benefits to it and maybe we're looking for a balance a balance for, for balance sure between individual and community right. and that's really the whole point of this conversation right, right. is how do we find that balance in our modern life today and, and it's exactly. a very different balance than exactly. it was in you know our grandparents age years and um um, I'm always searching for that balance in everything I do here at Moment, um, and personally too. Shailen, um, so I know you were involved in the Weave project, which was, uh, I don't know if you're doing that now, but I know you were involved in that, but is there some particular project that you would like to briefly tell us about that you think um, is like, or something that you'd like to see happen um, that that's in your mind? Sure, I mean, um, I'm, so many of my examples are, are related to America more broadly, right? And the problems totally we have with polarization <laughs> and other things and not being able to talk with people who are unlike us. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I would, I just wanted to respond to what Anita was saying because I absolutely agree. I think that I want to state clearly that the solution to hyper-individualism is never hyper-communitarianism. <laughs> In fact, we've tried that before. We tried it right before America pivoted back downward toward hyper-individualism. And in, in many ways, the downturn that, that, that followed the upswing that we talk about in our book was a reaction to conformity of the 1950s, the overemphasis on the community above the individual. And America has always been about the balance between our fierce commitment to individual liberty and our need to work together in order to make democracy work. Right. And, and I think that the problem is just that the balance has gotten out of whack. And so I think that um, 
real creativity around how to help people experience both of those things at the same time is needed. And I would also just add um, that we forget that, that the commitment of joining a community is itself a choice. Right. And I think that's actually one of the fascinating things about the modern age. In the past, we inherited our commitments. Mm -hmm. They were just defaulted upon us and they were forced upon us by yes. accidents of birth. Right. But in the modern world, we have the ability to choose what it is that we are going to commit to. We can covenant with a community. Right. And that, co that covenant is just a two way promise that I promise to sacrifice certain things in order to serve this community and the community will serve me in return. And that covenant is a choice. And as someone who is a practicing Mormon, that idea of covenants is central to our theology and also the organization of our lived communities, right? That the idea that we're here as a choice. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm in a roundabout way saying, you know, um, I've, I've struggled just as many Jews have to figure out my place within my religious community. But one of the things that inspires me about, about the religious communities that I'm a part of is that emphasis on choosing to commit and using my individual agency to make a choice to commit to something. And that I think is where we achieve that balance. It's not that you can never undo that choice, right? Because that choice is not forced upon us. But I think that um, when we dedicate ourselves to something, when we choose to dedicate ourselves to something, whether that's a co-housing community or whatever it is, we can often achieve that balance that I think has been missing in previous um, chapters of, of, of human evolution, in a sense, right? Beautiful. God, that was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you did that perfectly, Anita. So perfect. Oh my God. But you know, the, the, um, I really despise Jewish nostalgia, you know, the shtetl, the community that where everybody knew everybody and everybody brought chicken soup and um, people were living in abject poverty and women had no choice and no voice and couldn't go to school. And, you know, so this this sort of veil of, of Fiddler on the Roof on the past, on the Ashkenazi past, for sure, um, drives me bananas. You know, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back, but I do want to join. So I thought what you just said was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. But I think in order to join, and also we're talking about civil society, we're talking about democracy, democracy is community, that we have to also learn to listen to one another in a way that we're not listening to each other. People, we're all, we all think, oh, you know, our opinion is so important. We got to say our opinion. No, you know what? Our opinion is not so important. We need to actually listen to other people. And in that we may not, nobody today is having their mind changed by arguing with them. How many, when was the last time you convinced somebody through an argument that they were wrong and you were right? In a polarized community that we live in today, that just doesn't happen. But we do need to actually listen so that we have enough information to understand that person to be able to start building consensus and to find nuance and have the kind of conversation that can build not just a religious community, but build a national community and rebuild a national community in a very polarized time. This is something that I think about all the time. And it, it goes for the Jewish community, it goes for a Mormon community, it goes for you know democracy. Stalin, I see you shaking your head. It does, and I think I just would invoke the words of the patron saint of American communitarianism, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was, you know, a French aristocrat, traveled to America in the 1830s and was shocked to see how much Americans were associating with one another and working together and creating associations of all different kinds. And his realization that that was part of the lifeblood of how a democracy thrives. But we forget also that Tocqueville is the one that coined the term individualism in order to describe also what he saw in America. So, so his description was of Americans balancing these two things. And he actually invented a term to describe it, which is self-interest rightly understood. The idea oh. that our self-interest is important, but that ultimately what's in our self-interest is what's in the interest of everyone, right? That, that, that it actually serves us to have other people's needs met as well. And, for, and to be a part of that needs meeting. And so I think there's, again, that there's that threading of that needle of saying, how do I use my individual agency and my liberty to invest in something that's good for everyone? 
Mm-hmm. And maybe that involves some sacrifice along the way. And there's, there's some sanctification that comes through that sacrifice and that commitment that religious people, I think, really key into, and that that's an important part of our thinking about this. Um, and and I, But I do, I just think that that's a critical part. It always has been a critical part of America's success is achieving that balance between what's good for us and what's good for the community more broadly. And sometimes, again, we're just out of whack. We tend to, we have this narrative running that, that a democracy exists to preserve the right to free speech. But that's just a shouting match if you forget that democracy is also about compromise. Compromise means giving up some of my beliefs in order to accept the beliefs of someone else so that we can meet in the middle. And again, we've forgotten that other piece. We just need to get back into balance. And we can do that with our individual choices in terms of how we are showing up in community, whether we are showing up in community Mm -hmm. as consumers or whether we are showing up in community as co-creators. And we need to think about our tone, how we're interacting with these communities. Uh, I think people completely forget that if you speak in a certain kind of tone, no one's going to hear you. No one's going to listen to you. No one's going to really, the community that you're building isn't really going to be a deep community. Um, I just actually did a, um, finished a book with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which is coming out. And one of the things she talks about is don't put emotion into your, you know, into your tone. This is, you know, you have to like, if you're creating something, you have to really think about the long term of it. And I think we as a country are forgetting that right now um, in terms of civil society, which is our community, a very important part of our community. Um, are there some other things that you'd like to say before we finish up? Shailen? You know, one other thought that I just have had um, so often is that I think that we forget the value of vision sometimes. That, that vision is actually something that communities coordinate around, not just needs meeting, right? But of building towards something. And, and as a Mormon, the idea of Zionism is very present in Mormonism. It has a different meaning, of course, than it does in Judaism, but, but it has been an incredibly powerful part of Mormon peoplehood. The idea that we, that there's a vision for what we're building together and that that actually makes us hang together as a people. And I think that there's a template there that can be um, used, you know, not only as we rethink modern religious communities, but also as we rethink communities more broadly, that, that, that people have a really, today, especially young people have a very strong sense of what they are fighting against of what they are opposed to. They have a strong sense of of what oppression looks like and a weak sense of what what the ideal looks like, what they're building toward. Um, And having been in the Middle East during the Arab Spring, I saw this unfold in dramatic fashion. There was a lot of energy to fight against something, but when it came time to replace that old model with something new, there was, you know, there was no, inf- there was no, I, there were no, I, you know, there wasn't enough ideas or coordination toward building. It was all toward tearing down. And so I think that, that we need to remember that our communities need to be places where people can create vision together, create a sense of what we're working toward, what we're building toward, not just what we're against and what we're opposed to. And we have to share communities. It's really important. Um, like mixing, being in different communities as a, as I get to go to so many different, I get to participate and I make an effort to participate in so many different kinds of Jewish communities and also non-Jewish communities. And these are communities that don't see the other community. And it's really amazing. I mean, I can spend time in my hometown in New Jersey and that's a very insular community. And then I'm in DC and that's also, there are many communities within each one of them, but they are so insular. And I feel like we need to, be really careful when we speak about community, about mixing up our communities. Um, One thing that I've always thought about that I would love to do, like my, one of my dreams is we've, um, I've personally hosted a number of AFS students from uh, different kinds of students, different kinds of exchange programs at my home. And 15 years ago, um, I had a student from China, from Shanghai. And the first thing that he did was we were watching John Stewart together. And he saw, um, and he, he said, and John Stewart was making fun of George Bush. And he was absolutely shocked. <laughs> he was like, what? They're making fun of a president? And it was just a huge step in his understanding of the world. And he went and wrote a paper on political irony. But the fact is that that, that kind of mixing, that kind of program mixes communities. And I would love to see a domestic 
a domestic learning residential exchange program where someone from Nebraska goes to live with somebody who is in Vermont and where we actually create um, the same kind of bonds and maybe actually, even if it's just a few people, create some new leaders who know how to live in both communities. Because right now in the United States, we live in very separate communities. So there just... is such a program and it was actually on my list of things that I would love to, to, to shout out to. Um, there's a brand new organization run by young, very young people. Um, it's called the American Exchange Project. And this is exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to create a domestic oh, well, I need to help. exchange program. Mm -hmm. And they, they launched this summer, their first kids on planes, you know, going, you know, taking urban kids and going to very rural places and vice versa. And, um, yeah, and they're doing some really thoughtful, amazing work around this. And actually, when you look at the progressive era, the era that sparked the upswing in American history, this was a huge part of what the, the driving organizations of that upswing were doing. They were working to bring siloed communities into a shared space. Um, and I think that that's incredibly vital work that we need to do to restore our American sense of we and, and the sense of America as a community. Can, can I just ask you something, Shailen? So the the voter registration push, um, you know, patron saint of which is Stacey Abrams, um, to me feels like some of that, and that people who've been alienated from from uh, the democratic process forever um, and been pre prevented from participating are being actively drawn in by people who are organized organizers who gather more organizers, which it creates it creates a vision too. Um, yeah. And I think the whole black girl magic and the, the fact that there's this, this sense of black women as leaders um, is also a kind of a, a new vision for what, what government would look like if, that, if that's who our leaders were. So does that fit into what you're saying at all? I think it does. And I think one of the things about Stacey Abrams that sometimes gets skips over is that she's patient. Mm. She recognized what you and I were just saying earlier, Anita, which is community is built one by one relationship by relationship, meaningful experience by meaningful experience. And what I think Stacey Abrams success has shown us is that that's actually how you build a movement. That's actually how you build a community. That's actually how you build relationships across lines of difference. And, and that we sometimes we're looking for these panacea solutions where if we could just get this program through Congress, like things would be fixed, or if we could just get the minimum wage higher, like everybody would feel better. Um, but actually, I think that it's much more relational than we're willing to admit. And that's hard for Americans who are addicted to speed and efficiency to, 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 to have to slow down and invest in something that's much more human and much more organic than that. Stacey Abrams was not afraid to lean into that reality and she had huge success as a result. So her absolutely. loss as governor, you know, she didn't throw up her hands. She said, okay, yeah. we're just gonna keep going. We're gonna keep building relationships and they elected two <laughs> Democrats to the Senate. But this, is, yeah. but this is not a political question. I think no, it's not. It's about, it's about be, making relationships. Yeah, has to be taken out of the realm of politics only. Like programs, like creating programs, uh, mixing communities, and helping us get out of our bubbles are you know way beyond politics. And um, the idea of them is to create a more heterogeneous po politics for the future. Um, so that's I just want to. I mean, as as amazing as Stacey Abrams is. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So just, um, there was a, um, there was a, a gathering of, of women from one of the larger congregations in Boston with one of, uh, with one of the sort of sisterhood organizations in a black church. And they met for a, a good, a couple of years and read books together and met in each other's homes. And it was a very powerful experience for all of them. And it ended. It's, this is already, it's already 10, 15 years ago, it ended. And they were recently um, interviewed. I don't know where I read this. And they all regretted the end of that uh, book group. Um, they, had, they had gotten to know each other. They had been in each other's homes. They had eaten each other's cake and, um, and they missed each other, but it, it disintegrated because they stopped, they, whatever it was, for whatever reason, the book, the book group ended. And creating permanent communities or, or continuous communities like that is a real challenge. 
Yeah. Well, I'd just like to say that book clubs are an yes. incredible form <laughs> of community. They, and I think, Anita, you helped to give them a boost <laughs> with the Red no, Tent. No, no, no. They gave me a boost. Decades ago, but no. really an important part of Jewish women community. And I don't think it's just for women. And I think that it's, it was an organic um, community. And then you're right, they come and they go. I have another friend who has a, a book club, but now she's 101 and she can't read anymore. And so she can't run her book club and her book club has fallen apart, but they, you know, that's, that is an incredibly, we thinking about how to continue book clubs is, is an amazing thing we can do. And it's um, very doable. Um, I just want to say, I see Andres is back here for us um, that I think there's so much hope uh, to build community in the United States and to build community in the Jewish community. And I don't feel like we should be, you know, pessimistic or depressed. I feel like the opportunity is ours. The opportunity is always ours to seize. And we're so lucky because, you know, we're part of this community that's had 4,000 years of evolution. And we're just part of the evolution here. It's, you know, door to door. We are now, it's now our time to be doing the reinventing and on our kids' times are also, they're doing reinventing and the next generation will reinvent as well. And I think we have to have some trust in that. So back to you, Andres. I know we yeah. have Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and uh, Robert Rebecca is also joining us. I, I um, First of all, thank you so much for, for this conversation. I'm taking so many uh, things that stuck with me. I love, you know, uh, a, a Anita comment about nostalgia. And it remind me of a quote by, the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, which says, there's a part of the world that wants to go back to a past that never was, and, and another half that wants to go towards a utopian future that will never be. <laughs> and in the middle, we're, we're stuck. And I think that our job is to, to think that, you know, to take the good from the past, you know, and, and as Ashailin said, you know, uh, compromise between what's, what's ideal and what's real. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, read some of the questions that were out in the Q&A. Everybody's invited to put their questions in the Q&A uh, or uh, send them to, to us in the chat uh, directly. Um, so uh, interesting that, you know, and this is a question that I also had. Um, why do you think that the Chavura movement fizzled out? It had many of the characteristics that you were talking about, sort of a small self-organized uh, community creations and what, what happened there? Anybody wants to take that? They come and go. Um, I, I think a lot of the ones that I'm familiar with were very um, centered around family uh, observances and children and going through the whole life cycle and that even you know new babies and there was somebody who had a, an older baby so you had someone to help you and bar and bat mitzvah and the whole you know the whole life cycle and holidays together especially if you don't have a lot of family nearby so it, it substituted in a lot of ways for families and it comes and goes it's like book groups too it doesn't mean that it's not meaningful it doesn't mean that it didn't sustain and nourish the people through that and give them and their children i think great experiences but um, they, they, they come and go. And I don't know why it didn't continue. I think maybe the hyper-individualism, um, the fact that people are marrying later and having children much later, um, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, and I think, I think some synagogues stopped helping them develop because a lot of them were synagogue based or they broke off <laughs> from a synagogue and left. Um, so I think there are a lot of reasons. And, there's no reason that you can't revive this. And people continue to invent them. People continue to reinvent this and think they've invented something brand new. Um, yeah. But they, you know, so. I think, I I think still they belong to mine. I still, <laughs> I still love, I, I actually, you know, love our Kavara here that I belong to in, in DC and it still exists. And it has new generations of people who are involved in it. And I think that you're, there are a lot of new things like Kavaras that have different names now that um, have kind of replaced them, but there's many of them are still there. And in fact, I've talked to a few different people in the Jewish community, philanthropists who 
are hoping to reinvent the Kavara movement now um, to a new level and bring it to a new level of organization. So I wouldn't say at all that, that it's gone. I would just say it's one of the many substrata of communities that religious right. communities that exist and they're just a lot new, a lot of other new ones have been created as well since then. Can you guys pick it up from the, the, in, the, from the Havara movement and sort of uh, try to turbocharge it, right? And say, this works and this is, we can, we can be, this can, we can be all together, but we need small community groups as well. But I think synagogues pretty much stopped. They also stopped doing it. I don't know exactly why, but. Another name for Havaraz would be the independent minions that people find around or conscious communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just it just mutated a little bit to use an infamous term in this time of, time of pandemic, but uh, positive mutations in this case. Yeah, what I live in, in in Brooklyn, there are a lot of those groups like Romemu, like you know Kolot, um, that are that have a Habura ish structure in a way. They're not really a Habura, but they are. But they started like that a little bit. Shailin, in the in the, in the Mormon community, is there something like that? Something like the Chavura? You'll have to explain to me what that is. I apologize. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought because you were nodding, I thought you understood. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. There, there were there were there were small family based prayer groups, hmm. kind of self organized in some cases, supported by the by by the big communities. But they came as a response to people that did not feel at home in the massive you know, thousands of people synagogue setting. Yeah, I think they're not just family based, they're community based. Yeah, they're community -based. Right. I know a bunch of like, and they were also- But, but it was much more intimate than yeah. the big setting and of- more lay led group. also. So the Chavara that I belong to is really lay led. And even though there were many rabbis who were part of it, um, <laughs> it was lay led. So, and it is still lay led. Um, so, but it strikes me the Mormon community is a bit more centralized. Uh, on the contrary, actually, oh, Mormon, okay. the entire Mormon church is entirely lay led. So every single local congregation is uh, led by volunteers. Every single position is filled by a volunteer. Nobody at the local level is paid at all. And so that is actually something that's quite different is that every member, every single member, the, the, the vision or the goal is that every single member of the community is um, given a role, a job to fulfill, to make the community function. And also, um, they're very size limited, so they tend to limit, they're called wards, they tend to limit um, a ward, which is a local congregation, to, you know, 150 to 200 families. Um, and within that, everybody has a role, and, and they are geographically defined. So people do not actually choose their congregation based on affinity, or what, you know, what time they want to go to services, or whatever. They are actually geographically assigned, which is something that used to be a big part of how lots of different Christian communities were organized, um, Catholic communities in particular, and that has gone by the wayside. Again, that shift toward consumerism, where it's like we can choose which church we want to go to. Mormons have really stuck to that model of this is where you live, this is this is who you're in church with, um, which helps with um, often can help with demographic mixing and the church often sometimes gerrymanders the boundaries to make sure that there is a demographic mix. Um, so there's a lot of different things like that. So I think actually the, the, the whole church community feels a little more, um, uh, a little bit more like that than, than might, than, than average, which is interesting to share because I do think that Mormonism often has that, um, that reputation of being a very hierarchical, very centralized church, but the reality on the ground is quite different, which is which is fun to share. Which is interesting. It's actually a mixture of, of centralization in terms of the organization, yeah. but independence in terms of the actual provision of, of the services and the running of the services, which is an interesting right. model for us too. Um, there's something, there's a lot of questions here, but there's one that that is in, very interesting to me, which is about social media and their role in community. And, uh, you know, the question says that the social media platform, we think they want to build community, but in fact, what they want is, you know, increase their profit. So when we're using them, are we really helping to build community or are we following their model that is built to maximize profit rather than to maximize the relationship and the meaning. I'd like to and say to that, that that's not really always true. Like we have a big uh, com online community 
and some so and social media at moment and we have all these different projects at moment and some of them have their own social media and none of this is profit driven um we are mission driven we are you know we are there connecting with people who are connecting with us and who have you know for all sorts of reasons and creating this bigger community so of course we're not facebook or twitter and that's a different story um and we're using those platforms and that's and and but, you know but, you are but we're not using those platforms for profit no but in a way you are hacking the model because we are hacking the model because yes. the model is built to provide value not to you to the to the social media companies in other words echo chambers uh outrage fear are part of the business model what you're doing is you're saying i'm gonna i gotta take that model apart and i'm gonna use it for me without falling into the traps that they are putting me in because that maximizes their profit yes but interestingly if i if i could just say because i've had some interaction with with um people at facebook who are thinking about these questions as well as leaders of very successful Facebook groups, this is a problem because you'll get a leader of a Facebook group who just built the group to connect people who are interested in um, the year of the Jewish woman or whatever, right? And and they get to a certain size and that and that and they have built that community, but then Facebook is actually reaping profit through the use of that community as an advertising pool. And then you get these leaders who form these communities saying, hey, I should actually be paid for being a Facebook group, you know, and, and then it brings commerce into it in various different ways at various different levels, which I think can really complicate things. Um, and, and it is really hard when building a Facebook group community to walk that line to not treat the people who are in it as consumers. It's when the whole thing is built as a consumer entity. Which is so why we should tough. be building online communities that are off Facebook and using Facebook maybe to drive people to those communities, which is what we're trying to do, yeah. as opposed to having the conversation take place completely on the platform of Facebook, which yeah. I know reaches more people, but it's, it's, there's, there's a balance that we have to find there um, to do that. Yeah. I want to just say there's another question in there that's really interesting, which is the term community seems to be overused. <laughs> Everybody calls themselves a community. Um, and should we invest some more time in thinking about this? Well, I just would like to say that we did spend quite a bit of time working with JFN, um, talking to people about what community is. And I highly recommend that you read the Big Question Project, which I think, believe there's a link in the chat which has a lot of different points of view and definitions of community from a, a very diverse group of people. And you'll see that there's not a lot of, uh, not even the same language being used to describe community. Um, it's probably impossible to come up with one definition of community, uh, but it's in the diversity of those definitions and the diversity of the ideas about what could be community or should be community, I think you come away with a sense of a definition of community, if that makes sense. But, but maybe just to be provocative, I will say, I do think that the, the, the term community can be overused. I would agree. I would say, again, going back to my earlier comments, that I think that what, what defines powerful communities is actually commitment. Um, and so in the sense that we are forming a community where there is zero commitment required, whether it's financial, whether it's FaceTime, whether it's whatever it is, service of some kind, if there's zero commitment required, um, then I don't know that that is a community. Well, and is time, is time just, a commitment? Is time a commitment? Because Well, that's a, a good angle to, to ask. That's a good yeah, question. Yeah, a lot of people give their time and spend time participating in a community, but yet don't give $35 towards that community um or haven't so i mean that I, I i don't know the answer to that but somehow i feel like time is time maybe be one of the most important things that we have to give you know we can give 18 dollars towards supporting afghan refugees but we could also give the time to have you know an afghan family come live in our house i mean what is the what is the commitment um to me you know, sometimes that eighteen dollars is not as meaningful as the time commitment. 
Yeah, I also want to. I want, also want to plug uh, doorways to commitment and doorways into community. And I think um, I think Open Table. I mean, One Table is an example, and they actually have some pretty great numbers about what's happened as a result of the support for them. Um, as I said, Mind Pine is not a community in itself. I think it it's it's a doorway. Um, it it provides meaningful experience, but it's not a community like a synagogue is a community or like. Um, or Havara is a community, uh, or you know, or, or a service a organization is a community, but but welcoming people in is part of the project of community. Uh, I think <laughs> the door has felt closed to the Jewish community for a lot of people for a long time, and we are still uh, we still have a lot to learn about opening the door and translating everything and making sure there are no stumbling blocks, um, and that's uh, that's a different project. But it's also part, you know, to, to gather people um, is, is part of the project of community. I would consider Not my an Chaim a community, Not an by the way. Hmm? I consider my Chaim a community. I feel like it is a community of people who are interested in this topic and who have participated in it and who've been inspired to do something on their own in different parts of the world. And that there are people who identify with Judaism. Like, actually, to me, reading your book, your red tent book was one of the things that kind of drew me back into the Jewish drew me back into the Jewish world years ago, and um, the concept of mikvah and I wrote a book on spiritual bathing um, was because I was so it was it was a portal into the Jewish community, and I feel like um, but it is a community so I I'm not sure I, I agree on that. the organizations perhaps that work together but. The, for the, our users, the people who come, the, the people who, who find so me I, there aren't I, necessarily part of it. I, I guess this is, this is what so like, you said yeah. about communities so complicated to, to discuss. So to me, like communities are not just synagogues. No. Um, they're not just ACCs. They're just not communities that you go to and people bring you a cup of tea. I mean, there are people, we talked about QAnon. We bring earlier. tea to people at my time, I'm sorry, but we do bring okay. tea. Everyone but, you gets know, tea. <laughs> there are groups of people who belong to QAnon and they bring each other cups of tea too. And, you know, there's, I mean, the cup of tea, the cup of tea definition is an interesting one to explore. I think this was a fascinating conversation and I, I know we're, we're close to, to time now. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we said as, 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 as Nadine said, we, we have, our work out for us in terms of being those that help redefine community um, in this in this time. And um, I think that one of the questions that was there that is, of course, I'm biased towards it because I just wrote an article about it. Is the question about limits of the community, and it's also a question in this time of, as you know, Rabbi Serbia was saying, you know, without borders, but communities do have borders. So how do we define them? In these fraud days of, you know, polarization and 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 you know acrimony. So how do we how do we still define them? So I think that this is hopefully the beginning of a conversation that can take many different forms. It can continue in the pages of Mom Magazine. It will certainly continue in the in the framework of Jeff and in Jeff and conferences, events, and and webinars. And I think that this is a wonderful challenge as well as as. Uh, you know, you were saying before in the in the in the conversation for philanthropists, and you know, we work with philanthropists, and 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 philanthropists generally fund programs rather than funding meaning and relationship and community. And I think that um, the malaise of community that were that were living could be a um, wake up call for funders to really understand, you know, to fund with a community lens, with a meaning lens, what, with a relationship lens, what builds the fabric of community, what, what helps people be together in a better way, what creates the social, the, 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 the public square of a community, what creates the, those places of encounter that we seem to be missing in, as Shailene was saying, this extremely gerrymandered world. Uh, how, where are the places where we cross? Where are the places that we encounter? Where are the places where community emerge? And I, I, I love something that, um, that uh, Rebecca was saying about observing where people are. And I think that, you know, we do a lot of studies in the Jewish community, but we don't do enough 
uh, ethnographic studies, to call it some way. In other words, what are the places where natural communities surge? You know, what are, what is, what are the places where people self-organize and how can we help them to, uh, to uh, help them to, to uh, Anita's comment about the Chaburot, how we can empower them, how we can turbocharge them when they do occur naturally. So those, I think it's both a funding uh, set of priorities for us, a research priority for us, and, and, and above all, I think uh, a, a commitment to keep this conversation going and help ourselves, the Jewish community, but also help the world. The, Jew, the, the, the Jews, somebody said, you know, gave the world the art of being a people, and, and we maybe can help now too. What we do for ourselves, we also do for everybody. So thank you enormously to, uh, to uh, Shailene, uh, Rabbi Servio, Anita, to Nadine and to the team of Comment Magazine. They were always a pleasure to work with. And uh, Nadine, if you wanna just say something for closing. Well, all I wanna say is that, I think I said it, there's a lot of hope and we, in getting more diverse and having more diverse communities, we become stronger and we always have historically. Um, and um, just to remember, we survived 4,000 years and I feel like we shouldn't spend that time lamenting that we failed, but we should say we've done good work and we're in, we, are, we can do it, continue to do that good work and we can continue to inspire other people to do similar work in the United States and be part of that as well and in the world. Thank you to everybody. And we hope to see you um, at the uh, Jeff and Ideas Festival um, that is taking place uh, next October, around six weeks from now in virtual hybrid form this time. And to find any possibility to keep this conversation going, uh, happy holidays for those to celebrate and best wishes and best hopes for everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Shana Tova. Thank you. Shana Tova.